it's actually been really fun for me starting coaching and actually trying to understand what works for other people. And that's in turn helped me in my, my training myself. So I'm actually learning as much that I can put back into my own training from, from coaching other people. And it's been, yeah, both a great learning experience and, and a lot of fun to try and solve the puzzle because for some people it's pretty easy and what works for me is what really worked for them and for other people it can be really difficult uh and it takes a lot of like second guessing and a lot of uh yeah a lot, a lot of thinking <laughs> welcome to the spartan endurance series on spartan up podcast with host johnny Wade. hey spartans we are back with jonathan elvin for another great interview this time we talk more about technology and coaching and how to use the two to find your best self this episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by AmazeFit. From May 18th to May 31st, Spartan Up listeners can head to us.amazefit.com slash pages slash Spartan to save $40 on a bundle that includes the AmazeFit T-Rex Pro. That's us.amazefit.com slash pages slash Spartan. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Spartan Up Endurance Podcast. Uh, I've got John Albin again, and uh, John is a professional athlete now. He's a full-time runner, full-time racer, uh, lives in Norway. And we talked before about how he got started, uh, some of his training philosophy. So if you haven't seen that one, definitely go back and watch it because there's some very actionable information for everyone. But John, we talked a little bit in the break, and I wanted to come back and, and dive into this. Uh, everyone has the technology now. Everyone has a GPS watch. Everyone has a heart rate monitor. And I don't know that most of us know how to use it. Um, I, uh, I I bought this watch used from Ryan Atkins, and I know that it is not getting anywhere near the workouts it used to get. I think that it wakes up every day and says, oh, the life I used to have. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm wondering how you've put that to good use in terms of all these things that, you know, many years ago were military grade and a thousand dollars and available only to the uh the professional athlete and now everyone can go drop a couple hundred dollars and have incredible technology so i'll leave it at that but just just you know how do you use yours and how would you encourage people to to use the technology that's available to them um yeah i think i think i do take advantage of the technology that's out there at the moment but only sort of like 50 percent of the way like i'm a lot of the standard stuff so gps watch uh, heart rate monitor both plugged up into Strava and I've had a Strava account actually ever since I started running I think so I've got every single run I've ever done on there which is is kind of fun so that's kind of um, yeah kind of like the beginnings of getting into the technological side but if you look at things like lactate measuring where you prick your finger and have a little blood drop and sort of measure your blood lactate which is really popular in uh, in Norway especially or I think Ryan's got like a glucose sensor that's sitting on his arm now. Um, stuff like that, I haven't really, I don't have like a stride pod on my shoe giving me power and stuff. Uh, so I think I'm 50% of the way there, but not like full in. And I certainly do think it really does help and it can be great, especially Strava for motivation. And um, if you get your watch set up with the heart rate monitor and have your heart rate zones set up correctly, Take it with a pinch of salt, obviously, but it can be really helpful to try and have your faster runs at the right intensity and your slower runs at the right intensity and um, try and understand what these different intensities, what sort of training benefit you'll get from them and how tired you'll be from them. So how much rest and recovery you need from them. But I really do think that just going old school and just going out running, enjoying yourself and feeling what it feels like you can normally feel where your threshold is and if you're running just under sure. your threshold and stuff. So um, it's not a necessity, but it certainly is like a fun thing to have and adds a new dimension to training. Oh, and one thing you mentioned there about the idea of recognizing where your threshold is and then training below it is something mm. that I think a lot of people in uh, in OCR and, and also blending over to the CrossFit world got wrong for a long time where it was, you know, no pain, no gain. If it doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right. And yeah. uh, I saw a lot of people burn out in the gym, you know, putting in a hundred percent intensity for every Tuesday night workout and Thursday night workout and Saturday workout instead of saving yeah. it. So, so in terms of that, what, what's the easiest way to define that for people as far as what, what would you say they should be doing as far as managing that? So I've, I've actually changed my philosophy a little bit uh, or training into this year. And that might not be that it's good for everyone. It's just, I need to change up what I'm doing to create a different stimulus. But normally I would do uh, all my skiing um, 
everything below below threshold really in the winter. So I'm just trying to do a lot, and I do um, easy recovery skis. I do more like middle zone two happy sort of like skiing very long like two three four five six hours and i do like zone three yeah. intervals which is still beneath threshold so everything is is beneath threshold i don't think that is the best i do think it would be good for me to add in some stuff like shorter sprintier stuff over threshold uh but that's just kind of like the groove i i get set into and then maybe sort of uh 10 weeks before race i want to get prepared for a race say for instance i've only got one race and i'm just training for this one race i think really that two two and a half months is more than adequate to to prepare you for that specific race as long as you've built this big engine with all this um cross training and and easier running uh through the um through the winter so then i do faster running still to be honest under threshold but i would do specific running sessions where i'm going over threshold and then back under threshold then over and try and get used to the the lactic acid to try and really like yeah get get my body used to pushing and dealing with that lactic acid because come race day you can't just cruise around and really pace it evenly you're going to have ups you're going to have downs and your body's going to have to react so faster running, let, let, let's, more lactic, lactic let's break acid. Down, and, let's break down the word threshold a little bit too, though, oh, uh, just no, because no, I, no, I know no, what you mean, you but for somebody who's listening who doesn't understand, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, you're, when, you're, when you're talking about threshold, how do you define that? Oh, it's like everyone, it's, it's normally a word I try not to use because it's like such a dangerous <laughs> one that everyone uses differently. Yeah. But for me, a threshold, or I don't know whether this is completely right, but I look at it sure. as... When you go over threshold, you're on borrow time and within yeah. the next 20, 30 minutes, possibly an hour, if it's that golden day of the year and you've got all the gels in you and you're feeling great and there's a crowd, but it's hurting and it's, it's, you're going to start slowing down soon. It's unsustainable. If you're under threshold, yeah, exactly. If you're under threshold, you can, it's sort of happy hard. It's like, I'm pushing, but I can, I can just about do this. So they're happy sure. hard intervals. For me and i put my heart rate zones that on the boundary between zone three and zone four is that magical moment so when yeah. i go into zone four i'm on borrowed time when i'm in zone three i'm working um and it's giving me a good training stimulus i think and you can do much longer intervals um but the recovery time should be a lot less so i pr yeah. would prefer to do more intervals um longer ones at a easier work rate under threshold, especially uh, during the, the off season. It's just that time before the race, that's when you need to do your, you need to start producing some lactic acid to get used to it and also get those like short term gains, um, some faster running and some specific race preparation. So start doing some sessions where you run at your race pace in your race terrain with your race obstacles if you can and start really trying to mimic the race so there's no surprises come race day you practice your gels you practice your clothes you put your body through water and you've got cold and you've run up and you've run down and stuff so that's that um sort of two and a half months before the race and then you have maybe like a two-week taper where you try and still do some of these sessions but just cut down the, the quantity so what you've been used to you're doing less of so that we should leave you fresher yeah, and the the picture of uh, somebody at the finish line completely splayed out on the ground, panting, arms at their sides, uh, is not how you're ending every workout. Oh, uh, no, I mean, I, I I used to think that I, I saw Rocky Balboa. I think I'm Rocky Balboa. <laughs> I have to train like Rocky Balboa all the time. And give it like six months as a full-time athlete trying to train like Rocky Balboa. You got really fit, but oh my God, you cannot sustain it. And it's not going to, yeah. it's not going to end well. Uh, so you by phasing your training, you can you can really get around that. And also you can have a lot more fun. So to go into the mountains and do some like really long zone two sessions or some like cool long zone three intervals um, where you don't have to feel sick, but you're still running like hardish. Sure. And you're flowing through the terrain and stuff. There's so much more fun than either going super duper slow and boring in recovery or yeah. I want to puke out my eyeballs like okay, that sort of training might work for some competitions, like maybe some really short track stuff, but it takes a lot of balls to say, I'm a mountain athlete, I'm an endurance athlete, and okay, all the studies have been done on college track runners, and that's great for them, but we need to train differently because we're, we're training for different events. 
we don't just upscale what a track athlete would do and do it a lot more. Um, but yeah. And, and then the other thing I want to ask you about in terms of, uh, learning how your body adapts and, um, and responds elevation is going to play a lot into that. And I, and I think about, you know, you, you've done some mountain running, you're, you're, you're known as a, as a sky runner. Uh, how have you trained your body to be ready for that? And I, and I ask on behalf of anyone who's going to, uh, any kind of a mountain race, you know, for somebody who hasn't run at all in the mountains, 5,000 feet or 10,000 feet is a lot. I know you've run yep. a lot higher than that, but, um, but what's been your experience and, and what can you share with people? I, I don't think they're going to like the answer because really, um, <laughs> A lot of my planning what races I'm going to do in the year revolve around which ones are not at altitude because I found I yeah. hate altitude. I like running strong. I like feeling like a strong athlete. I live at sea level. Put me at two and a half thousand meters and I feel like a 10 year old girl with asthma. I feel awful. So I just, <laughs> I hate it. And I've never really been able to crack being acclimatized. Like I've always felt that I'm at a big disadvantage. Um, I have taken a slightly different approach this year to training where I've done a lot more zone two kind of like middle middle training. And I'm hoping that's going to allow me to race with the lower heart rate. So that means I don't max mm -hmm. out my heart rate at the beginning of the race. And that means that I can actually like survive through the race rather than just maxing out my heart rate and then just it never, never recovering. Um, but yeah, I, I've always tried to avoid races at altitude. And I know that's not always possible, especially when you win the Spartan World Championships and then they move it to Lake Tahoe for the next uh, next four or five years. Um, yeah. But I mean, that's it, it's a reality and a lot of races are at altitude. So um, all you can do is when you get there, don't bother doing loads of training. Just get there and relax and drink lots of water. Try and sleep well because even, even the climate is different and that's going to affect you negatively. So just make sure yeah. you're drinking, making sure you're getting your electrolytes on. Try and get there three months before if you can two weeks they say is minimum <laughs> anything under that is like apparently no point and you should just turn up two minutes before the race um sure but yeah i mean good luck is is the best thing i mean altitude chambers and tents possibly i've never done it myself i hear you sleep really badly in them because it's like sleeping in a greenhouse kind of norway is actually one of the only countries in the world where i think it's still not allowed so if you're a Norwegian citizen, you're not allowed to use altitude chambers, but the rest of the world will um, allow it. So you can sleep in like an altitude bubble uh, at night and that should have some effect. Um, but yeah, I mean, the most important thing is don't go off too hard. So just pace the race yeah. well, because once you go over a threshold, you won't be coming back down again. You won't recover because yeah. you're just, the, the air isn't there to recover you back down. Um, and don't get any burpees because if you get burpees and your altitude, <laughs> it's just, it's just not pretty. <laughs> so one thing you said that I think would seem counterintuitive to some people, but it makes a lot of sense. When you said, if I know I'm going to be running at altitude, I'll dial some of my training down zone wise so that I get used to running at a lower heart rate and don't feel the need to run at that higher heart rate. And that, that, you know, I think a lot of people would have thought I'll run harder at sea level so that when I get to altitude, it doesn't feel as hard, but, but what you said yeah. makes a lot of sense about tra training your heart to, to be used to running lower. Yeah. So try and get your race pace, uh, the race pace you want at a lower heart rate. Cause I've, I, I had quite a few years of this. I either wanted to train bottom end of zone one, really recovery or train threshold or above pushing really hard. And that meant if I'm now then going to go and race for three, four hours, my body only knows how to do one or the other. Whereas hopefully now I've had a little bit more of the middle gray ground that apparently we shouldn't use, which I found extremely useful. So hopefully I can race more around zone zone two, three, and actually be able to manage through. Uh, but at the moment, it's it's worked for some athletes. It's um, just going to see whether it works for me come um, come the autumn. Just thankfully, the Spartan World Championships is not going to be at Lake Tahoe. So hopefully it's not too big of an issue anyway. Yeah, you want to maybe get ready for some heat, but I think that might be the uh, the worst of it. So, yeah, yeah I'll just get a sauna. One thing that you really touched on there that um uh, is is figuring out what works for you, and and you know there's all kinds of resources you can read and studies you can look at about generalities, 
But you're right that each individual is going to respond slightly differently to different modalities and things like that. And obviously, in your case, you have more time to experiment as a professional athlete and the stakes are higher for you. But the same applies to even the most recreational athlete who's just trying to get better. Just because something works for John Elbin or Johnny Wade or whoever else doesn't mean it's going to work for you. So so if, if you go on and try that and find it works great, but you, you still want to put the time in to, to, to learn how your body's going to respond to different fuels, foods, training methods, things like that. Yeah, I think like um, it is a continual learning process. And I think uh, you, you're going to learn your entire life about how you how you handle training, how you handle different foods and, and stuff like that. And it's also going to change through your life as well. What I can handle now is way different to what I could handle when I was younger. So, um, yeah, it's always going to be a continual learning process. And it's actually been really fun for me starting coaching and actually trying to understand what works for other people. And that's in turn helped me in my my training myself. So I'm actually learning as much that I can put back into my own training from from coaching other people. And it's been yeah, both a great learning experience and, and a lot of fun to try and solve the puzzle because for some people it's pretty easy and what works for me is what really worked for them. And for other people, it can be really difficult. Uh, and it takes a lot of like second guessing and a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of thinking. <laughs> well, that, that's an interesting point. I, I've heard in the past, if you want to run fast, don't just learn from a naturally fast person because they didn't know what it took to get there. And I, I, you know, I know your background. I know that you've worked very hard to develop the strength and the speed and all the different things. And, uh, and so as a coach, you can, you can apply all those same lessons to that person as opposed to, you know, the, the world's fastest sprinter or the world's best goaltender isn't going to be able to teach me necessarily that much from, from, from the ground up. But in terms of your, your, uh, your coaching clients for the describe, describe to me, uh, an average coaching client, like who reaches out for coaching and why? Um, to be honest, I've got the, the whole spectrum uh, I normally have like between 10 and 15 athletes and I've got anywhere from like 20, 30 year old, really competitive, pushing hard up to sort of 55 year old, good age group that just wants to bring those times down or even just do their, their first Spartan. And it, it's really fun, like how different types of training affects them all, all differently, but they all have this same drive in common. They've all said, I'm lacking something and I want help. And I I try and help them out, and we try and um, we try and get them to their to their goals. And it's been it's been a lot of fun, and it's been really successful. It's just a shame there's not been as many races as there should have been over the past um, past two years. So uh, sure. I'm excited and, to see how they're going to go go in the autumn. And yet to come cir- full circle back to the the start of the conversation about technology, what a difference that makes uh, for people's ability to uh, measure where they're at to share with their coach for you to be able to say to them, Hey, this is where you want to get to heart rate wise. Um, and they can actually manage that. Um, you know, j- just, just the fact they can jump on a zoom call with you and then you can see them face to face. Um, but yeah. what, what would you, what would you say in terms of, um, that interaction? What, what sorts of resources do you find the average coaching client is putting, putting to use? I think to be honest, the communication aspect is probably, the best thing and I use a program called final surge and within that it's kind of like Strava mostly like training peaks but a little bit less data because that data is great for a triathlete but to be honest it's a bit much and it can be a bit like overwhelming whereas training um, final surge is kind of more touchy-feely you you have more communication uh, between coach and client and there's more like how do you feel um, bars and you can put in whether you have an injury and you can do a pain report and stuff uh, and then obviously I get to see heart rate data and um, GPS data and, and splits and stuff as well. So it's all there and I can check it every single day. They wrote post-workout notes. I can read them every day. We can chat within each workout or we can just chat generally. So this sort of like every day being able to see where they are, how they're feeling and changing training and discussing whether they've got any niggles or or injuries that's been like really great like it's not just a a zoom call every two weeks or or every month to to like catch up it's kind of like you can really live their training as if you're living your own um so yeah i mean the communication these days is is crazy especially when there's a pandemic the fact that you can still reach out to someone and have this uh communication the whole time is is really cool 
Awesome. Well, hey, I'm very grateful for this communication today and the fact that I can speak to you in Norway from here in Minden, Ontario, Canada. Uh, and wherever you're watching in the world, if you want to reach out to John, what, what's the best way for them to, to get a hold of you uh, regarding coaching to see what you're up to to follow your racing? Yeah, I think probably just to, I've got a website, jonathanalbin.com. Get on there. I have a racing blog, which obviously hasn't been uh, updated in a little while, but there's an email address on there, um, fire over an email. And uh, yeah, I'll be happy to to answer any questions generally anyway, even if someone messages through on uh, Instagram, I try and, try and message back um, as promptly as possible. Cool. So jonathanalbin.com, uh, follow your racing blog, which is going to explode soon <laughs> when we all get back out there. And uh, and I would definitely uh, endorse you and say anyone who wants to reach out to you for coaching, not just your expertise, but your 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 personality, your mannerisms, as they've hopefully got a, a hint of from this interview. So, John, thanks so cool. much. I look forward to seeing you back on the course. Um, I'll be on the sidelines. You'll be on the course. And uh, I'll cheer you on when you go by. Nah, it's been fun. So, um, yeah, happy training, everyone. And, yeah. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by AmazeFit. From May 18th to May 31st, Spartan Up listeners can head to us.amazefit.com slash pages slash Spartan to save $40 on a bundle that includes the AmazeFit T-Rex Pro. That's us.amazefit.com slash pages slash Spartan. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Endurance Series on Spartan Up Podcast. Spartan Up is your partner in resilience for mind, body, and spirit. We're here three days every week. Tuesdays, you can find Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan, interviewing biohackers, business leaders, authors, and athletes. Thursdays and Saturdays, catch episodes from our DECA, Endurance, Trail, Combat, and La Ruta series. Do you know someone who needs a little nudge? Maybe they could use some motivation, tactics to be stronger, healthier, happier, more successful. Tell them about our show. And if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. We want to know who's watching and who's listening. Thanks. See you next time.